our nation was founded on principles of freedom, religious freedom, freedom to speak, freedom to have opinions. And we are living in a day and an age when that freedom is being challenged in such a way that I would say even shut down. The First Amendment actually is an interesting uh, clause, the very First Amendment that was put together when our Constitution was made, saying Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or, and this is the part that always gets skipped in the modern dialogue, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or of the right of the people to peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. That is our First Amendment. And it's interesting because at the time that they wrote it, the Founding Fathers were all of a Christian background. And they were coming out of a European Christian background. They were Lutherans and Congregationalists and um, Pietists and, and Calvinists. They had all of this Christian background. And some of them had drifted to a point where I would say they kind of believed in God, but not necessarily Christian. They were deists. They were not atheists. And all of them established the idea that they had come from European countries where there was a special state religion, meaning that you as an individual, whether you believed or not, would be taxed and your money would go to build a church and finance pastors and finance the church. They said, we're not going to do that in the United States. Every religion is absolutely free and it's on its own. And so the first clause, that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, was actually in order to support the second part or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That was why they said that we're going to let everybody be free to do what they want, think how they want. And we live in a time and an age when that is changing and changing radically. In recent years, we've all seen a slew of lawsuits, employment uh, changes that have happened, dismissals from, uh, from places of business, the pulling of funds and boycotting of businesses, online attacks and harassments, state and local laws specifically targeting people of faith, we have seen consistently the state is now demanding that people surrender their free rights of belief. In fact, it seems to be, as I'm watching over the last 20 years, it always falls into basically there's four areas. Four areas where the state is trying to take over and command people of belief. And the four areas right now in our society are homosexuality, gender identity, abortion, and immigration laws. Those are the places where it seems like the state is saying, you are not free to exercise your religion in any of those categories. We will enforce the belief system on those areas. And over and over we're seeing this. Paul Coleman, uh, who is the executive director of the Alliance Defending Freedom, uh, uh, he wrote a quote and he says, he was discussing these new hate speech laws that are in Europe and people are wanting to bring them over to America and establish them here. He says, in many European countries, the state wants to shut down debate on hot topics. Sunday sermons, media articles, even private conversations have been subject to criminal investigations as a result. Nonetheless, speech laws are not only a growing concern in Europe, even in the US, censorship on university campuses and on online platforms is growing. Coleman said in his book called Censored, that's the title of his book, he addresses the rise of hate speech. And he addresses the, law, the rise of hate speech laws in Europe and their effect on the freedom of speech. In Germany, for example, committing an insult can be a criminal offense. In Poland, offering religious feelings, or um, offending religious feelings, that is, carries a two-year prison term. If such examples, along with 50 others described in his book, show how the hate speech laws are being used readily in Europe. In the U.S., calls for the indoctrination of hate speech laws are growing. James Gottry, also of the Alliance Defending Freedom, he says this. He says, those who seek to put an end to religious freedom, they're not just targeting the freedom of others. They're targeting your freedom. The move against religious freedom is more than a narrow targeting of a highly visible individual. It is a com comprehensive onslaught on an entire worldview. It's specifically the belief that an all-powerful God can and does prescribe what is moral and what is true. 
If you are a person of faith, it is an onslaught on your worldview. That they may not yet have knocked on your door or on my door does not change the fact that they are seeking to condemn our entire cosmological um, neighborhood. When the former chairman of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights says that, quote, religious liberty and religious freedom are code words for discrimination, intolerance, racism, sexism, and homophobia, he is, he is talking about your religious freedom. When a New Mexico Supreme Court justice says that compromising the religious beliefs that inspire life is the price of citizenship, he's talking about your religious beliefs. When social media unleashes its vitriol against HD, HGTV stars for attending a Bible-believing church, participants aren't just calling for the cancellation of a television show, but for the eradication of your personally held beliefs. Very true. This is the America we live in. More and more and more, the state is saying, God doesn't get to be the highest authority. The state gets to be the highest authority. And the state will tell you what you may or may not believe. This is actually a very common theme when it comes to the Bible and when it comes to people who have followed God. It was a common theme when the church was founded. It was a common theme in ancient Israel. It's been a common theme throughout the state of no matter whether it was in ancient Assyria or Babylon or whether it was the Romans or whether it would have been much, much later, the state has always tried to say, we get ultimate control to tell you what you may or may not believe. So although we're living in dark times, we are not living in new times. The question is, how do we respond? What does God want us to really do? We're going to go through a series over the next six weeks called Not Just for Kids. I'm going to take all the old Bible stories that you may or may not have heard as a child and kind of unpack them for adults. And today we're going to unpack Daniel chapter 6, the famous story of Daniel being cast into the lion's den. And the interesting thing is, Daniel's whole experience of going into the lion's den was because the state said, you must worship the way we tell you to, you can't worship the way God tells you to. So let's unpack that story together and see what we could learn about Daniel, his response, how he functioned, what he did, and I think there'll be some lessons in it for us. If you've got a Bible, turn to Daniel chapter 6. If you don't, we have provided these excellent New King James versions that are all over the building here. Grab one, it'll be on a seat next to you or on your table or nearby. Grab one of those and turn to Daniel chapter 6. Uh, can you, Ryan, can you bring these down just a little bit? I'm getting a hideous glare up here and I can barely see my notes. 895, 895, Daniel chapter 6. Now before I can really unpack Daniel, I want to give you a little background on uh, the setting of what has happened by the time we've even got here. So originally, Assyria had dominated, this is the Middle East, and for several years, centuries, the dominant power was the Assyrians, and I think the next pit maps the, is the Assyrians, yeah. Egypt and Assyria, the Hittites, these were the dominant powers, mostly Assyria emerging from about 900 to 625 BC. Assyria emerges as the dominant power. In fact, in 722 BC, it moves in on the northern kingdom called Israel, wipes them out and takes what we know as the 10 tribes and uh, scatters them and brings them out, takes them all over into Assyria. Um, I now feel like I'm in the dark. I wanted these overheads brought down and I wander over here and I'm in the dark. I can feel it, boom. And I don't like being in the dark. It's never been a, one of my favorite things anyway. Play with that too, we can figure that out. So the Assyrians are the dominant power. They have taken over Israel, scattered the 12 tribes into them, so they've wiped out more than half of the ancient Israelites. For a long time, they are the people that everyone has to reckon with. However, there's this little upstart city in the middle of the Assyrian Empire. I think the next slide has that. And no. Next slide. It's thinking. The computer's thinking. The little upstart town is called Babylon. Now, Babylon is an ancient city. It's been around since 2200 BC. It's one of the oldest cities on the earth. So Babylon has been there for a long time, but they were absorbed in the Assyrian Empire. And slowly over time, 
the Chaldeans who dominated and lived in this area got stronger and stronger and stronger. They were more ancient people even than the Assyrians. But they're inside the Assyrian Empire, and as they grow stronger, eventually they're big enough to take on the Assyrian Empire. And uh, what happens is one of their leader rises, and uh, we'll go with Nebuchadnezzar, and he becomes the new king of Babylon, and he decides he's going to wage war against the Assyrians and overthrow them. And in 605 B.C., he does. In 605 B.C., he conquers all of what is uh, the Egyptians and the Assyrians get together, and they go to the Battle of Carchemish, and the Egyptians uniting with the Assyrians on one side, the Babylonians on the other side, go to war, and the Babylonians end up winning. They send the Egyptians back to Egypt, broken. Uh, they'll be many, many years before they rise again as a power. Assyrians are completely destroyed, and the Babylonians emerge as the world's superpower. And in 605 BC, since they're taking over all of the Middle East, they wander down into Jerusalem, and they say, you too, we're taking you too. And so in order to start conquering those people, they took a whole group of their top-level citizens. They took the sons and daughters of the most elite people in society, and they captured them, they took them captive back to Babylon. Probably at that time, one of the captives, 13 years old most likely, would have been Daniel. Daniel's dragged from Jerusalem as a devout Jewish boy, and he goes back to Babylon, and there he's going to spend his life growing up. He becomes a very popular guy with, uh, with uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar is famous. These are artist renditions. He has the famous hanging gardens. He had this beautiful wife that had come from the mountains. He brought her down there. She missed the mountains because Babylon was flat, you know, desert area. So he built this huge palace to be like a mountain. It had flowing waterfalls and gardens, one of the ancient wonders of the uh, seven wonders of the ancient world. It flowed along the Euphrates River. It's a beautiful place, and this is where Babylon thrived. Uh, from about 625 till 539 B.C. What's the next slide? Let's see if we get caught up. Yeah, Babylon. Okay, so give me another one. Let's see what happens next, because I'm behind now, or one of us is behind. Ooh, cool graphic change. <laughs> oh, yeah. So Daniel, he's popular with Nebuchadnezzar, but, you know, Nebuchadnezzar dies. His son Nabopolizer takes over the throne, goes off to war, and leaves the grandson Belshazzar in charge. Daniel gets forgotten. He's an old guy. Who cares about him? And so he's a forgotten man, and Belshazzar throws this huge feast. And in the night of the feast, he says, hey, let's bring those vessels up that were from, captured from Jerusalem, those golden cups and those goblets, those things that are from the temple worship that was in Judah. Bring those up, and let's have this wild party. We'll drink out of those cups. And so they're having this huge drinking party, and uh, it's wild, it's carousing, and they're using all of the cups and the silver and the gold that was brought from the temple that had been dedicated to God and God alone. They bring it up out of the treasury and they're using these to defile them. They're, it's, it's, it's a point being made that we're the more powerful gods. The gods of Judah are small. That puny God couldn't stand against us. And now we're drinking out of his cups to show him how puny he is. And right in the middle of the feast, these fingers emerge and write on the wall, mini, mini, tekel, ufarsin. And everybody sees it. And as you can imagine, they're a little alarmed <laughs> when fingers write an all. And so Belshazzar says, who, who can read this? What does this mean? What does this mean? Who can read this? Nobody can read it. They bring in all the wise men, all the astrologers. Nobody can read it. Finally, his mom says, hey, there was a guy in the time of your grandfather, um, and he was really smart, and everybody knew who he was, and the Spirit of God was on him. He's full of wisdom. Let's, let's drag him up. And so they find Daniel, old guy by now. They bring him, because it's 539 by now, so he's probably... You know, well, do the math. He was probably 13 years old in 605, so he's an old guy. They drag him up from wherever he's living, and the king says, I will make you the third in the kingdom. Why does he say the third in the kingdom instead of number two? Well, because number one, Nabopolizer, is off waging war. So he's there monitoring, monitoring Babylon. What does this mean? What does this mean? Can you read it? Daniel says, you can keep your third in the kingdom nonsense because here's what it says. You've been weighed in the balance and found wanting. And tonight your kingdom will be taken from you, will be divided. And indeed, that very night, what had happened is outside the city, while they were having this drinking party, they were literally under siege by this upstart group called the Persians and the Medes. And the general of that combined empire was a guy named Cyrus. And so Cyrus, he comes in and he takes over. And that night they dammed the city 
or they dammed the river that flowed through the city. So they marched in where the riverbed was and they took the city and killed Belshazzar. And overnight, the Medes and the Persians have control of this huge, vast empire. However, Cyrus, he is the Persian. And at this time in history, the Medes are the stronger people and Cyrus is, and the Persians are the lesser people. So what Cyrus had done is, he is a Persian, he was the general who was in charge, and he had conquered the city, but he couldn't take it himself. So what he did is, he married his, well, I'm just gonna get this right. His mom was a Mede, his dad was a Persian. And so he goes to his mom and says, okay, your brother is about to inherit the entire throne of all the Medeans. He gets the Median Empire throne thrown in. So what he does is he marries his cousin and makes sure that when the uncle dies, he becomes the king of both the Medes and the Persians. So he has to consolidate his power. So when he first takes over Babylon, he actually is not the top dog. His uncle, Cyaxerxes, is the top dog. And though he's the general and the conquering and everybody's treating him like king, he's not quite king yet. It's going to take him two years to consolidate his power. So what he does is he goes to his uncle and he says, hey, I got a palace for you in Babylon. I just took the city. It's mine now. And I set up a palace there, so I'm moving you over there and you can be king of Babylon. And so he sets up that king and he has a personal name, Cyrus Xerxes, and he has actually a king name, which is Darius. So Darius gets to meet Daniel. And they become pals. And this is where we begin in chapter 6. So the somewhat puppet king is sitting on the throne. Cyrus is off consolidating his power. He's going to come back two years later and take over the entire world, one of the largest empires the world will have. What by chance is my next slide? Because I don't even know. I got lost. We missed one, so I got a little lost in it. Anetta, what's the next slide I have out there? Oh, it's frozen. It doesn't even matter what the next slide is. I'll, all right, well, we'll catch up with those slides. That's going on with something. Similar. All right, so let's begin with what happens. And actually, let's begin back up to verse 30 of the last chapter. It says, That very night Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius, or Darius, it can be pronounced either way, the Mede, note this, he received the kingdom. Interesting words, he didn't take the kingdom. Somehow he received it. Someone gave him the kingdom. So that's part of the hint that he's Cyrus Xerxes. And he was about 62 years old at the time. So he's a 62-year-old guy being sat on a throne. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom and over these three governors of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give an account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then... This Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because of an excellent spirit and was, was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. And then these men said... We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Interesting thing about Daniel, he emerges, he's already a smart guy. He had already been top dog under Nebuchadnezzar two generations back. He had fallen out of favor for some reason, didn't care much. Belshazzar brings him out of the dungeons, throws the gold chain on his neck anyway. The whole thing falls apart. Belshazzar's kill, killed, the Babylonians are destroyed, the Medes and the Persians enter, and here comes this new Median king, Darius, and he's like, I need some help here to help me monitor this thing. Who's this guy standing here in the golden chain necklace? He must be good, he must be somebody. He says, well, it's Daniel. Old guy, he hears his record, knows who he is. All right, you're in charge. He has you and you and you, three guys, are put in charge of 120 others. So what they break down is these 40 are under you, these 40 are under you, these 40 are under you. We break the entire kingdom down in regions. And what the king's goal is, is he's saying, monitor your regions, raise the taxes, keep the peace, enforce the laws, keep things going, make this thing run smoothly. And Daniel's area of jurisdiction runs real smooth. Everybody's happy. The laws are enforced. The taxes are fair. 
not only the taxes fair, but the revenue increase brought in is the most. And so over time, the king, it doesn't take him long, it takes him probably a year, and he's looking at this going, you know, Daniel's region, with his 40 guys, runs so well, and I'm making so much money off them, and there's so much peace there, and I don't get court cases brought up to me, and there's no unrest, and there's no civil disturbances, I'm going to put Daniel in charge of the whole thing. I mean, that guy, and so what Daniel has is he has favor with God, he has favor with men because he's excelling. And it's interesting because then the leaders come and they say, we've got to get rid of this Daniel guy. For your old veggie tail people, you know how the song goes? Oh no, what we gonna do? The king likes Daniel more than me and you. Oh no, what we gonna do? We gotta get him out of here. I probably should have played that video for you. And you could have watched the dancing onions sing that song. All right, gotta get rid of him. So what ends up happening is uh, they decide we've got to get rid of this guy because he's excelling, he's doing great, and the problem with Daniel is he's not corruptible. That's partly why his region is running so well is he won't tolerate corruption. So they decide, let's investigate him. This guy has been in government since the time he was a teenager. Let's investigate him, and we're going to dig up some dirt on him. Now, what are the odds that if they started investigating someone who's been in government policy since the time they were 20, that they could find dirt on them? About 100%, right? Let's be honest. If they did that to any politician in America, 100%, you're going to find dirt of all kinds on that person. So they began to investigate Daniel, and they can't find any dirt. It's like, well, let's find out what he's done. Let's find out, you know, if they would have had a, a Babylonian Me Too movement. No, he's clean there. <laughs> he was a eunuch. That's probably why, right? <laughs> he's clean on that. Let's find out if anybody's taken bribes. No, any place he's had a corruption, any place that he has done something that we could charge him with. And this guy is probably 80 years old at this point, and he's been in government. There must be a time and a place when he's done something so horrifically wrong. We can drag that in front of the king. We can get this guy scandalized and out of here. And they can't find a single negative thing. Because godly people live for God's laws, no matter who's looking. Amen. See, this is the thing God's establishing. We were talking about a time when the state's changing things. Godly people, they're going to look for God's answer to their problems. Godly people live their lives on what does God want me to do, no matter who's looking. Godly people establish their rules, their authority, their laws, and their behavior based on who is God. And Daniel had lived his whole life honoring God, and so there was no dirt on him at all. And so his enemies look at him and say, you know, there's no graft, no incompetence, no major mistakes, no double talk, no lies, no corruption, no bribes, no Me Too movement. What are we going to do here? The only thing that Daniel sticks to, which is not like any of the rest of us, is his religion. His faith in God is not ours. So if we're going to knock Daniel out, we're going to have to find a way to do it based on his God. Let's get rid of his God, and we can get rid of Daniel. And that's what they decide to do. The state always wants to put God aside. It always has in history. We're talking about a time, you know, 2,500 years ago. And the state was doing it then. Let's read on what happens next. Verse 6. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said this to him. King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors, the advisors, have consulted together to establish a royal statute to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish this decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. So they come to the king and they say, hey, I'm sure this is the scene. This has been the Babylonian Empire. We've just taken it over. 
And you're the Mede king, you're from the Median Empire, we're a different group of people. You know, this is a vast empire. In order to consolidate everybody, in order to tap their patriotism, what we need to do is get everybody on board to worship just one God. And that one God is going to be the state. You, O king, he is the state. So for 30 days, we've all got together and counseled this and talked about it. And so for the next 30 days, what we want to do is have everybody in the entire empire put aside their own God and worship you, king, the state. And that will unify all of us together into one big collective, and that way we can keep things calm and we can actually have a smoother takeover. And by the way, king, all of your advisors and all of your councils and all of your head leaders have agreed to this. So if you sign this law, and as you know, according to the Medes and the Persians, once it's signed, nobody can undo it. That's the law here. So we think you should sign this. Now the king is not paying close attention. For one, the counselors who are coming to him aren't everybody. Who's missing in the group? His number one guy is missing. Daniel's not standing there. I'm sure other counselors, leaders, satraps, advisors, and others were not standing there, is an elite group of people who are standing there convincing the king this would be a smart move for us to unify the state. And of course, you, O king, would be the only person. And it's just for 30 days. It's just for 30 days. They could only pray to you, only petition you. They got to put their other gods aside. It's interesting because back in the days of when Daniel was a young man, Nebuchadnezzar had tried to get everyone to worship one big huge statue he built, which was his, a representation of his state. A golden statue. When the trumpets blow, everybody's going to bow down and worship this statue. See, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't saying, stop worshiping your own God. He was just saying, add this God as the highest God. Right? So you can keep worshiping your own God. Just add this one on and acknowledge this one gets the highest God in the pantheon of your religion, of your faith. If there's ever a conflict between your God and this God, the golden statue I'm building, the golden statue takes precedence. Right? That's what he was saying. And three of Daniel's buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused to bow to the new God that represented the state. And they got thrown in the fiery furnace. Uh, But then Jesus showed up with them inside the furnace and brought them all out and freaked the king out. And then he made a law. Okay, everybody has to worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right, so that's how that story went. Here it is, a generation later, and Daniel's now there, and it, now the law isn't just add our God to your gods, it's stop worshiping who you worship for 30 days and worship only what we say you can worship. Right, you have to not just add our belief, you have to eliminate yours, but it's 30 days and we're going to do this, and what the king's thinking, 30 days, yeah, it'd probably be a good idea to unite the whole kingdom. That, you know, we're new, we're the Medes on, on the throne, nobody knows us yet, you know, we're not firmly established, it'd be a good way to unite this people group we've just conquered, let's, let's bring them in, and it's the Medes and the Persians, and everybody knows the real power on the throne right now is Cyrus, he'll be known in history as Cyrus the Great, but he's not in town right now, he's back in the depths of Persia, solidifying his power, so the guy in town is Darius, and he knows once I write this, I can't undo it, because I've got to answer to Cyrus the Great, my son-in-law who's also my nephew. Things were a little freaky in those days. <laughs> Let's read on. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and crafted a blog and sent it out as a scathing rebuke to everybody he disagreed with. No, that's not what the text says, does it? <laughs> when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and tweeted against everybody who he disagreed with. <laughs> No, it doesn't say that either, does it? No. It says, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. And then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God, and they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within within 30 days, except you, O king, will be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true. According to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter, 
You know, you know the way they say that? That must be the way they said it, right? According to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. It's just a phrase they kept throwing out there. So they answered and they said before the king, well, that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself. And he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. And then these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, will deliver you. And then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. So they come and they say to the king, it's interesting because the whole idea is that uh, Daniel lives a life to God. Since his early days, he's always lived for God. Daniel doesn't try to fight what's going on. He doesn't go out there and say, well, I need to go to the king and tell him to change the law. I need to do... Daniel's like, I've been doing this. I've been honoring God, worshiping God, loving God since the time I was a kid. I'm not going to change now. He prays three times a day. It's interesting because he opens the windows and probably they were already open windows on the rooftop of his house. And he prayed towards Jerusalem. And it's interesting because he must have really known the scriptures, which I'm sure he did because he was a scholar. He was one of the elite scholars of his time. And one of the things he would have read was the book of 1 Kings. And in 1 Kings, when the temple was dedicated by Solomon, Solomon in chapter 8 prays this incredible dedication prayer. And one of the things he actually says in the prayer, which is a prophecy, I think the Spirit of God anointed him to pray this prayer, record it. One of the things he says is, if, O oh God, we are ever rebellious to you, and because of our rebellion, you destroy this temple and scatter us to other empires and other places, and in our sin and in our rebuke, we find ourselves living far from Jerusalem and his temple is gone. We will turn our faces to Jerusalem. We will repent and we will pray to you until you return us. So here is Daniel fulfilling this prayer. That was about 500 years earlier. And he bows down and three times a day, and I have a hard time imagining, you know, I mean, this guy's so faithful. He's the, one of the top leaders, he's actually the number two or three guy as a top level leader in the superpower of the world. And he still has time three times a day to stop everything and pray. Right? It's like Martin Luther once said, I got so much to do in a day if I didn't spend the first two hours in prayer, I could never get it done. It yeah, it makes it possible, right? So Daniel, three times a day, as one of the top administrators in the superpower of the world, is continuing his habit. Three times a day, i got to pray, or I'm not a good administrator. Three times a day, i got to seek God, write my mind, write my heart. got to hear God tell me what to do. i got to let God direct me and teach me and guide me. So three times a day, he's been doing that. He says, I can't stop now. I know that's what the state has said. The state said, worship the state instead of my God. But I know it's my God who's the source of everything. And I also know my God will not be happy if I turn my back on him now. And now I'm choosing between whether to turn my back on my God, who I've known from the scriptures and known from my own experience all these years, or whether I turn my back on what the state is telling me to do. And he says, but if I turn my back on God, I'm not going to be of any use to the state. Because that's the source of my strength and my power and my wisdom. So I'm going to stay with God and trust that God has a plan in all of this no matter what. I'll stand firm with God. So his interesting, it's interesting when, the, when his enemies go to the king, they don't say, hey, your top level best advisor, Daniel, is still praying. They don't say that. They say, hey, that guy who's one of the exiles from Judah, that guy who's a foreigner, that guy who doesn't belong here, that guy who has no business being in our country, let alone being in a top level of leadership, that guy who's not a Mede or a Persian or a Babylonian, what kind of ethnic heritage is that? That guy who shut, doesn't belong here, he's defying you, O king. That's what they're saying. At first, they've got to demonize him, right? That's how they demonize him. 
And they say, he's, he's coming there and he's still praying. And I love that thing. Then Darius realized, it's like, bing, the lights went on with Darius. He's looking at the guys here and he's thought, you know, I thought somebody was missing when you first came to me and said everybody was in on this. If you have ever worked in church for any long period of time, there's this kind of famous saying where people always send you an email. We don't get it hardly ever here anymore. You know, down the old, old uh, silly day I did. But you just get this thing in church. Well, we all think, fill in the blank. We've been talking and we've decided. And you always get these emails or these comments people make about, we all have discussed this. And then you always ask, who's we? Yeah. You found, oh, it's, it's you and your one friend. <laughs> right? You and your one friend aren't we all. And church gets this a lot. If you know, all you guys who've been in church, you know it, don't you? You've been in church. We all have been discussing this, and we have all decided, and we all think that the church needs to do this, that, and the other thing. And, uh, and then you find out there is no we. There's three of you, you know, and in a lot of churches, and there's 250 of the others, right? But that's, a, that's a trick people like to do in church, make themselves feel like, oh, we're the power. We have all been talking, and this is what we think, Right? And so that's why it's kind of nice. We're a congregational polity church, and so we've got big decisions. It's like, well, we're going to gather the we together, and we're going to hear from we all together in a room, right? And then we'll find out what we think. And so, but see, Darius hadn't done that. He had listened to those small voices. And he realized, I love that. And then he was mad at himself. Why would he be mad at himself? He's mad at himself because he realized, I got duped. I'm looking now at, hey, wait a minute. Who are these guys standing here? Oh, man, these are my worst administrators. I've been wanting to fire that guy. That guy, I'm going to chop his head off next week. He doesn't even know it. That guy right there, right? He's looking at, that guy's corrupt. I'm trying to find the charges against him. That guy, the region he's running, is constantly in unrest. This guy get nothing but letters of complaint from his region. He's looking at him going, you're my troublemakers. Why was I listening to you? And he realizes, my number one best guy, oh, this was all about that. You told me it was about the state. You told me about solidifying power. You told me it was about patriotism. You told me it was about us being united together. Now I realize, no, it wasn't. It was about you getting rid of Daniel. And he's mad at himself that he fell for it. And the text says he spends the rest of that day gathering, basically he's gathering his lawyers and his leaders saying, all right, let's find a loophole. I made this decree. It was stupid. I now see why I did it. They conned me into doing it. I wasn't paying attention. It's making me feel like an idiot ruler right now. I, if the ruler can get conned by these idiots, he's a bad ruler, and I'm a bad ruler. He's mad, so he's looking for a loophole in the law. And they go, and they look, and they look, and they look, but oh, these guys who had brought the decree in the first place, they already knew he would do that. So they made sure there's no loophole in this law. And at the end of the evening, he doesn't have a chance, and they come back, and they say, okay, king, the day is done. Daniel's been accused. He's been found guilty. Now you have to fulfill the law that you wrote. And now you can feel the antagonism. And so he takes Daniel down to the lion's den. And he's like, Daniel, I'm sorry. I've got to do this. I don't want to. I apologize. I'm going to do one thing. If your God is for real, the God that you were willing to worship over the state, the God that you were willing to stay in league with, even though you knew it would mean this. The God that you were willing to obey in spite of what I said, in spite of what the law said, in spite of what the state said, the God that you were not letting go of, that you're going to honor, may that God protect you right now because I can't. They throw Daniel in the lion's day and they roll the stone over it and they put wax, they drip the stone with wax and they put their rings in it sealing it so they can make sure this doesn't get broken into if the stone gets rolled away the wax seal will break and nobody has the emblem on their ring except the king has his own no one can make that one so they know it's the rings and he gets some of his lords and nobles to do it so they make sure nobody can break in because that's the way it's got to happen and daniel spends the night in the lion's den and the story picks up now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting and no musicians were brought before him also his sleep went from him. And then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. And the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. 
My God sent his angels and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. Now to just make proof that it is a miracle that happened is the next verse. And the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions. Then their children and their wives and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. So the question, oh, the lions had been fed. They weren't hungry. No miracles going on here. The lions were just peaceful that night. They were relaxed. No, there, see, Daniel got in there at the right, right time. See, in the, no, no, just to verify that the lions were ravenously hungry, King says, okay, I'm just going to prove this a miracle. You, 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 you throw them in. And because of their laws, that meant you had to throw their whole family in. Because if you killed one member of the family, the other members of the family, even if they were little children, were duty bound to grow up to either kill you or assassinate you or destroy you. Right? It's a blood feud laws. And so it's like, I can't just kill one person. We have to kill the whole family because the blood feud laws mean they will always be coming back to try to undo me. So that's why they throw the whole families into the blood feud law civil society. And before they even hit the bottom, the lions are on them. So the guy's standing there like, well, I guess they were hungry after all. It was a miracle that Daniel's God must have preserved him. It wasn't just coincidence. And the king Darius wrote this. To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Very interesting because, and I, we were losing it in the slides, but back up a couple of slides and hopefully it's there now. Are you frozen, Anetta? Or are you, you back up, I'll tell you when I can see it. Yeah, yeah, right there, right there. That's ancient Babylon. That's the archaeological dig site of ancient Babylon. At the time, just a generation before Daniel was emerging, there was a prophet named Isaiah. He's, you know, he's about 50, 60 years before Daniel. And at the time, the Assyrians are the superpower. Babylon's not a superpower yet. And he prophesies about the city of Babylon. And in chapter 13, he gives a whole prophecy about Babylon. And what he says is, Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, who will not regard silver. And as for gold, they will not delight in it. Also their bows will dash the young men to pieces, and they will have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eye will not spare children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation. Nor will the Arabian pitch tents there, nor will the shepherds make their sheepfolds there. But wild beasts of the desert will lie there, and their houses will be full of owls. Ostriches will dwell there, and wild goats will caper there. The hyenas will howl in their citadels, and jackals in their pleasant palaces. Her time is near to come, and her days will not be prolonged. At the time Isaiah said that, it'd be like prophesying, you know, there'll be a day when New York City's nothing but rabbits and coyotes and deer running around it. People would say, you're an idiot, right, if you said that. Babylon was a powerful city. Isaiah prophesied that. That's Babylon. God knows what he's doing. Because even Darius realized, oh, there's only one kingdom that will never end. It's God's kingdom. There's only one kingdom that is steadfast, and it belongs to the living God. Right? The kingdom which is the one that shall not be destroyed is the living God's kingdom. All other nations, powers, states, 
will come to an end. And, you know, I'm a student of history, so I can look at that and say, one day, that will be Washington, D.C. It will look like that. The state will fall, the state will crumble, the empire will diminish, another will rise, but God's kingdom will endure. God's kingdom will march on. God's kingdom will still matter. And so when we live our lives here, our question to us is, whose kingdom are you investing in? The state's or God's? Whose ruling power do you bend the knee to? Washington, D.C. or Jesus Christ? All of us are struggling with that. And believe you me, there's times it would be a lot easier just to compromise to the state. But what God is saying is, research things, find out what I have said. When it comes to issues of abortion or gender identity or immigration, what has God said? Not what is the culture saying, what is society saying? What has God said? And how does God want me to act in that? Build your knowledge now, build your identity now, build your practices now, so that you will be able to discern when the state says, oh, do this instead. Because believe you me, the time will come, and it won't be just those issues. It'll be about property ownership for churches and freedom of worship. That's what's coming. And so build now what it is you know you need to establish. So when the day comes, you'll be able to discern, no, I'm going to live for the kingdom that will not be destroyed. It was Pastor Martin Niemöller, who many years later reflected on the Nazi years. He was a pastor in Germany as the Nazis were rising. And he said this very famous quote. He says, they came first for the communists, and I did not speak up because I was not a communist. And then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak up because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak up because I was not a Jew. And then they came for the Catholics, and I did not speak up because I was a Protestant. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak up for me. I, I don't really know where each of us is going to fall. It's easy to read stories in the press and in the newspaper and see as, oh, that's just that individual. That's just the girl who's on the you know, elected to the Parliament State or the Senate of the UC Berkeley Student Union. Oh, that's just this guy who owns a, whatever, a bake shop in Colorado. Oh, that's just some, that's just them. That's their problem. You see, if you don't, all of us need to start seeing what are the trends that society is doing? Because I think one day, knowing where we speak and who we speak up for, you know, whether it's immigrants down on our border, Right? And I know we all will probably vary in there. I've done the ancestry on mine. You know, my family was able to come across on boats in the 1840s and 1851. My mom's side in 1851, my dad's side in the 1840s. And you know what it was in those days? If you could get here, you were in. That's the, that was where the immigration laws. If you could get here, you were in, right? So they got here. And so now we sit saying, what does God say about immigration? What is, what's God say about foreigners in our midst? What, what's God's word on that? We ought to study these things and be aware of them. You know, what, what is God saying about racial harmony and righteousness? What is God saying about all these issues? Because a lot of us are like, honestly, truthfully, I don't know what God says. I'm waiting for society to tell me. I don't really know what God has said. I just have my opinion about things. Right? But it shouldn't be, well, honestly, including me, who cares about your opinion? Your opinion is not going to be the kingdom that lasts forever. <laughs> God's kingdom will last forever. It's what's God's opinion. And how am I pulling myself in harmony and in league with God's opinion? And where does God want me to stand? And where does God want me to back down? Where does God want me to fight? Where does God want me to be a peacemaker? Where is God telling me on these issues? That's what all of us are wrestling with. Because the one for sure thing throughout history over and over and over again is the state will always demand allegiance to the state instead of to God. Even when it was a Christian state, they would want allegiance to the state over God. That's never going to change, never has changed. The question each of us is wrestling with is, when the time comes and I have to be in my lion's den, 
I mean, you can watch that video of that young girl. She was surprised. But that was her lion's den. And she stood in it. Bravely, strong, you know. It, was hurt. it hurt her, but she did it. And so the day is coming for each of us in the room when you will have a lion's den experience of your own. Maybe not on a massive scale, but it'll come. And when that moment comes, for all of us, what we want to know is, am I for sure standing where God wants me to stand? I don't want to be standing on a party politic. I don't want to be standing on, you know, my group's identity of what we think should be. I want to be standing for sure on what God has said. And so it requires us to study and know and listen to the Holy Spirit and practice the prayer that leads us to the right decisions. Let's pray. Why don't you stand with me as we close in prayer. Jesus, we, we know that in America at this time, it's difficult to be people of faith, to people who are standing by your word. But the truth is, in every generation, that's been the case. And the generation in the past had to stand up against established racism and Jim Crow laws. They stood up against how women were treated. The generation before that, Lord, they were dealing with slavery. Generation after generation has had to stand up in its moment and say, this is where I stand for what God's word has said and not for what the state says. And Lord, we want to know what is your word. We want to know what is your truth. We want to know when you ask us to stand and fight and when you ask us to be peacemakers and acquiesce. And we want to know, Lord, that all of our opinions, all of our ideas on all of these issues that come, they come from your holy word and the power of your spirit. They don't come from earthly wisdom. And so we ask you to give us a hunger and a thirst for your word and an ability to receive through the power of your Holy Spirit, the wisdom that comes from your throne. May you fill us all with courage and bravery. May you fill us all with equal parts of mercy and love and graciousness. This we ask in your most holy and wonderful and glorious name, whose, whose name will live forever and ever, and of whose kingdom there will be no end. Amen. Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. All right. God bless you guys.